What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to kind of one of the last parts of the Industrial Revolution, which is on economic ideas that come out of this. And generally speaking, when people hear economic ideas, it's almost as bad as talking about essay writing in class where everyone just kind of zones out. Uh, this is one of those times that it's really important to focus in. I'm going to keep this uh, short on slides and kind of short on details and expand on a lot of this stuff so you understand it. Uh, these are important things that still connect to today with our economy and how things work and how businesses run. And if you know someone who owns a business, uh, some of these ideas still exist today. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go forward today. We're really talking about two different economic ideas that come out of this industrial revolution. And the first one is called capitalism. And the term capital, which we've mentioned in other videos and in class, refers to money. And capital is the money that people decide to invest in businesses. For example, you can take money that you have, and if you think, for example, that uh, – Apple is a good company to invest in. You can take your capital or money and invest in that business. And capitalism is generally the way our economy in the United States works. Um, the goal of any business and any business owner, as we talked about from the Industrial Revolution for factories, is to make as much money as possible. Um, there are rules and laws in place to set up to make sure that they that people don't break laws, that people pay workers fairly. But for the most part, the goal is you open a business, you want to make money. And if your business makes money, maybe you own a second business or a third business and you expand your business. And that's the idea of capitalism and this concept of capitalism and building up a business to make money and having people invest capital in your business really comes from um, a person called Adam Smith, and this is him right here. He wrote a book called Wealth of Nations. Basically, the idea was how have these nations around the world during the Industrial Revolution or right before at the start of the Industrial Revolution got gotten wealthy? How have they made their money? And one thing that he looked at that a lot of them had in common is they really use this system called capitalism. And his big concept that comes out of this, and this is a French term, laissez-faire, and the idea behind laissez-faire is that the government should not get involved in business decisions. They shouldn't put um, requirements or what we call regulations on business, that businesses should be able to pay workers what they want, businesses should be able to um, charge what they want for products, and that the government shouldn't really have a say in that, that the government's job is to have what we call, and when you hear laissez-faire, I usually say hands off, free market, get your hands out of my business, um, government, we are going to make decisions for ourselves. And this laissez-faire system, hands off, every time you hear it, put up your hands, hands off. The laissez-faire system says government stay out of our business model and what we're doing. And if you follow politics, the Republican Party generally agrees with a lot of this laissez-faire stuff, that the government shouldn't get their hands involved in business. Um, if you know anyone who owns a business, there are a lot of government regulations and government government requirements that people have to follow in the United States today. But laissez-faire, hands off, would say stay out of our business decisions. That, for example, the government shouldn't tell people how much to pay workers. That if people don't want to work for $2 an hour, that the business will be forced on their own to raise those wages. And if no one will work for less than $10 an hour, there will be a natural progression because of laissez-faire and the government not telling them that they will get to decide how much to charge. So laissez-faire means free markets, governments stay out of the business. And the price of everything in our country in a capitalist economy is not decided by the business per se. It's decided by the consumer. So how much does this bottle of water cost? Well, it costs whatever people are willing to pay for it. And this is a Kirkland um, brand. So people are probably willing to pay less than like a smart water. And I took my daughter to the movies a couple weeks ago and popcorn was $7.50 for a medium popcorn. A medium freaking popcorn was $7.50. Why can they charge that much? Because people at the movie theater are willing to pay it. And if people are willing to pay it, the, that movie theater will continue to have $7.50 popcorn. I mean, it's literally a kernel of corn that they popped that now people eat because it has salt on it and therefore they can charge $7.50. It seems like a ripoff, but I paid it. And since I paid it, I'm telling that business, it's okay to set the price this high. If you go outside the movie theater and you buy a thing of popcorn from the grocery store, it's not going to be $7.50 because they know they can't charge that much. Because when you're at the movie theater, you can only buy popcorn from one spot, and that is the movie theater. Um, that's why a soda at the movie theater is $6.50. Trust me, I know, as opposed to if you go to 7-Eleven where it's so much cheaper because you have more options. So 
This whole thing is set by supply and demand. And what supply and demand is, as supply increases of something, demand of something goes down. For example, Converse sneakers. There is a huge supply of Converse sneakers, so demand goes down. The new Jordans that are gonna come out in a couple weeks, the supply is gonna be low, so demand is gonna be high. And if demand is high, that means the price of things go up. Okay, so this is all, the prices are all set by what people want and how much of something out there. This whole concept is capitalism. And this is the primary basis of the United States economy today and of most industrialized countries. While all this is going on, there is another economic theory that runs exactly the opposite of capitalism and it's communism. And these two bearded, fine bearded individuals are named Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. They are German. Uh, they believe in something called communism. And the root of the word communism is COMM, which usually refers to bringing people together, community, communication. So in this case, we have Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx who are gonna write something called the Communist Manifesto. And what their prediction is, is that there are two groups in this industrialized society, in the Industrial Revolution. There are those who have, called the bourgeoisie, there's that term again, bourgeoisie from the French Revolution, and there are the have-nots called the proletariat. And that the workers who are the proletariat, their working conditions are gonna get so bad and so horrible that they are gonna eventually overthrow the haves because the working conditions are so awful and atrocious. And that his prediction was when these have-nots, when these workers overthrow the owners, they are going to create a civilization or a society where everyone is equal, where there are no more owners, where all of the workers own the factories together. And in this concept of communism, that everyone will be equal, they're going to create a society where the government owns everything, where government owns every business, every natural resource, every school, everything. And that the government, not not the businesses, the government makes every single decision. They decide how much things cost, what to produce, what to make, what you can buy, how much a tub of popcorn is going to cost. All of those things get decided by the government. And in this system, everyone is 100% equal in its ideal form. Um, the person who works at, I don't know, works as a street sweeper in the Industrial Revolution should get paid the same amount and will make the same amount as the um, neurosurgeon and that everyone's job is considered equally important. So we all work together for the common good of it. This system does not take off for a while. This is the Soviet Union flag, which is going to be created in the 1920s. This system during the Industrial Revolution of communism never really takes off. And the reason why it never really takes off in the Industrial Revolution is many of these governments that are capitalists allow unions to form. And workers start in these non-communist countries in these capitalist economies decide to start joining together to demand better wages. They protest and they walk out of the factory, for example, and they say, we're not working until you give us an eight hour workday or a 10 hour workday. And the business owner's like, oh my God, I got no one here to work anymore. I better give them a 10 hour workday. And these unions are successful in fighting for things like minimum wage, um, safety standards in factories, um, fire protocol, so we don't all die to fire. Uh, things that allow workers to have better conditions. And these unions are people united, these workers who are united together to fight for better working conditions. If you know anyone who's a teacher, for example, uh, I or teachers are part of uh, a teacher's union at the school and then a bigger teacher's union that exists in the entire United States. Fired firefighters, part of a firefighter union, doctors, nurses, um, police officers, there are, and if you know anyone who works in construction or electrician or plumber, those are all union, generally union jobs where people are part of a group to demand better wages and to set certain standards. So because of this, and because of these improvements in the capitalist economy, most of these governments in the United States, in Great Britain, in France, don't turn to communism. And communism kind of falls to the wayside until about a hundred years later, which we'll eventually get to with um, Karl Marx, I mean, Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin. One last side note to all this, which doesn't really fit in well to this, but it's part of Britain, so that's where we're going to drop it, is during this time period, this is Ireland over here, the British, are, the English, have a famine in their country, and they start stealing potatoes, um, and basically stealing the food from the Irish people, leading to a huge famine in Ireland, and many Irish people, this is in the 1860s and 70s, so many Irish people 
who can't eat anymore are forced to, because they're starving, decide to leave the country right here of Ireland because the English people over here are stealing all their potatoes and they travel across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. So during this time period as well, we have this huge migration of people from Ireland coming to the United States. Those Irish immigrants are um, discriminated against. They are told they don't belong, that they're not real Americans and they're treated differently. And some people try to ban the Irish from coming into the country, but the Irish successfully come. Um, odds are if you have Irish ancestry that your Irish uh, ancestors might have come during this time period. And as a result, Made this huge wave of people as a result of this what is called the irish potato famine so that's what i got for today if you got any questions as always write it down um hopefully this serves as a good little uh understanding of the economic systems although it's it's just a, a basic overview so as always any